Welcome to episode one of the Views from 314 Feet podcast with the Pitcher List Podcast Network. My name is Randy Wilkins, and I'm very excited to introduce Yankees beat reporter from The Athletic, Chris Kirshner. Chris, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to get going here. Yeah, so am I. How was, uh, how was your weekend? Weekend was fine. Um, I've been back in New York. Uh, I left Tampa a few days prior to the final day of spring training. So just getting ready for the start of the season. I'll be in Houston on Wednesday, then from Houston to Arizona, and then the grind is on from there. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the season. Uh, my second full season on the beat. I started in August 2022. So it, it might be my fault that the Yankees haven't been good since I started. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's going to be a fun season. I'm excited to watch Juan Soto for 162 games. I think, I think that guy's awesome at the plate. Um, just watching him for the past month, it's been really fun. So it should be an exciting season for the Yankees. What do you, what do you think? Uh, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than some people would be on uh, social media. I'm always like the optimistic guy. Um, so I feel good about him. I really feel good about the lineup in the bullpen. We'll get into this later. The rotation, you know, I think uh, has some question marks, but I think Yankee fans are blessed to see Juan Soto and Aaron Judge back to back for however many games they play together. I mean, I think that makes a huge difference, especially coming off of last year. And as someone that had been begging the Yankees to get left handed hitters since before the pandemic, like even around when they got Stanton, I'm like really excited to see this lineup top to bottom, just like with the balance that they have. So I feel much more confident in the in the offense this year than I have in years past or recent past. Um, just because I think that the approach to beat the Yankees is much more difficult now, you know, like that Tampa Bay Rays, like right-handed relief pitcher that throws a hundred and just striking everybody out on the Yankees. I think that that's going to be a little bit more difficult now. So, um, and I just like the energy of the team now There's Stroman and Soto and, you know, they're not, they, they won't feel as buttoned up, I think. And they'll probably, at least maybe for you, especially there'll be even like more interesting stories to tell just because there's like more personalities and more ways to engage the team, like the actual like players than in the past. Um, so yeah, I feel, I feel good about it. I feel good. I feel confident as much as I can be right now. So, I mean, I definitely hope that they're more interesting. Um, that's one thing that I've learned since coming on the beat is just like how media trained all these guys are. Um, it's hard to get like interesting stories of their backgrounds, who they are as people. I, I just feel like a lot of them are a little bit nervous to say what's actually on their minds. Um, you know, coming from covering the NBA for four years prior to um, getting on the Yankees beat, that's not the case in the NBA. Like those guys are saying whatever's on their minds, whether it's political, social, religious, it doesn't matter that they're, they're going to say whatever they want. So I, I wish, I wish we had that with the Yankees beat. Um, like for, for example, Aaron Judge. I don't remember the last time Aaron Judge said something remotely interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I wish it. I wish it. It wasn't the case, but that's just how it is. Um, a lot of everything is like you know kept under wraps, state secrets. It, it's unfortunate because you know I feel like the fans are the ones who miss out on that stuff because you look across the league and and a lot of the guys you you know, you have a good sense of like who they are. It's just hard with the Yankees. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to try my best not to name drop the captain a lot on this. Um, but sometimes it feels relevant. Just, I mean, even behind the scenes to, to get guys on board when we were trying to interview them or just speaking with them. Now this, like I had great interactions with, with Jason Zillow, uh, head of PR at the Yankees. Um, really nice guy. Like I have nothing bad to say at all. Like this isn't necessarily a criticism, but even speaking to the former PR uh, directors at the Yankees, it, it, there's just a lineage of that. It's just like the history of that franchise. It's just their ethos. 
engage with them beyond just like their performance and not always look at them as baseball players. And, um, you know, obviously with Derek, that was part of his ethos and a very conscious decision to be as vanilla as possible. And it just feels like you, you're missing out on things. But I think with guys like Stroman and Soto, at least the the energy and the vibes will be a little bit different. I don't think they're going to say maybe Stroman will at some point. Uh, I don't think they'll go into the like political realm or say something that could be super controversial that isn't baseball related. But at least there's a little bit more like flair and dramatics, I guess, that'll make them a little bit more of a modern sports team, not just in baseball, but any sport. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hopefully that brings – there'll definitely be a different energy at the stadium with Soto there. Um, and I think oh, when Stroman oh, yeah. pitches and he pitches well, there'll be a different vibe, which which I love. I mean, that's that's that, those are the environments I would prefer to be in as a fan. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So there are listeners that used to listen to the previous iteration of this podcast. And uh, I just wanted to give a brief overview of how this came to be. And again, thanks, Chris, for doing this. This is awesome. So we had the blog uh, right before, well, in 2019, it was Bobby, Steven, Matt, Derek, and myself. We started Views uh, partly as a um, nod to former river as blue river Ave blues and we wanted to like pick up that baton and we picked, we did the blog and then we decided to do the podcast and of course um the fir- very first episode of the podcast we did in the studio it was derek bobby and myself and then literally a week later the something like something named covid hit and then a pandemic hit and that kind of just threw everything off uh as expected and as everybody experienced so um, we did the podcast remotely and then, uh, life got in the way for a lot of us. Um, Derek had a baby, Bobby's job responsibilities increased with the pandemic and, um, he was able to make moves in his job. So that required more of him. Uh, I ended up doing the captain. Matt, uh, is a teacher and had another kid and life just got in the way. So we had to shut the blog down and, um, eventually stop the, the podcast, but I always wanted to keep it going. Um, because as Chris and I have spoken, uh, try to stay away from the hot takes. It feels like hot take culture is taking everything over. And I wanted to put into action something that reflected how I wanted to see, um, the media space, I guess, and the podcast space, um, a little bit more along the lines of what I believe in and what Chris believes in. So, um, I pitched it to Nick at pitcher list. Uh, Nick was all about it. I think we're the first or one of the first podcasts that is just focusing on a specific team, uh, which is new for Pitcher List. Um, And then I reached out to Chris. Chris wanted to do something as well. And like, you know, great minds think alike. And here we are. So, um, yeah, that's how that's how we got to this point here. So really excited to get this going. Uh, We're going to do this every it'll drop every Tuesday. We'll record every Monday. And um, yeah, we think it's going to be great. So. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, what you, what you mentioned with like the hot takes and stuff, um, it, it's easy to get caught up in that just because that's what gets the most engagement. I mean, if you look on social media, you say something crazy, people pile on that just adds to engagement. Um, I think there's a, there's a place for it for sure. But I think with me being around the team as often as I am, uh, you know, no one on the beat has a podcast or no one is on a podcast regularly. Um, so I think that is something that can differentiate from what you might hear from other Yankee podcasts. Cause a lot of them are coming, coming from a fan's perspective. Um, you know, I, I grew up a Yankees fan, but like now that I cover the team, you know, I do have to put that aside and, and, you know, call it how I see it. I think people, especially last season with how mediocre last year was i think fans who follow me and and read my work know that i'm gonna call it how i see it um and i'm not i'm not scared to say if something's going wrong or if something's going right i'm gonna say that as well so um i think that's what you should expect from this podcast for sure absolutely so let's get right into it uh let's get into some news obviously 
the biggest news of spring training is Garrett Cole's elbow injury. Uh, he'll be out for the foreseeable future. I think they all caught a break. We caught a break. Um, the Yankees caught a break. Definitely Garrett caught a break with it not being something as serious as um, a Tommy John surgery or a brace surgery. But, Chris, can you tell us a little bit, give us a little bit more background on how this injury came to be, Garrett's perspective on it, and um, how the Yankees plan on moving forward in his absence? Yeah, so um, he pitched one outing um, in spring, I believe he threw two innings. Um, after that, he had a live batting practice, and preceding that, um, he just wasn't recovering well in between those outings. Uh, he he told reporters that it kind of felt like he was throwing 100 pitches when in reality he was throwing half that. So that kind of set off some alarm bells for the Yankees and for Cole himself. You know, he's been the the model of durability for starting pitchers, especially in his generation. You know, this guy is just never hurt. If if Cole's in your rotation, you can pencil him in for 30 plus starts, 200 plus innings every single year. So it was, uh, you know, un, uncharted territory for um, for Cole. So once that happened, they sent him for tests. Um, you know, thankfully the MRIs came back clean as far as a tear goes, but you know, there is some inflammation in his elbow. Um, there is some swelling in his elbow. So he's in the middle of, uh, a three, a two to three week, no throw period. But during that time, you know, he is able to, you know, do exercises and, and just keep his arm loose. So when he does resume throwing, he's not starting from, you know, the, the floor essentially, but there's going to take some time for him to build back up just because of the fact that, you know, his spring was cut, you know, short, he essentially didn't have a spring training. So when he does resume throwing and, and gets to a point where he feels comfortable throwing off a mound, you know, it's still expected to be a, a full six weeks of um, spring training to get back to the regular season and, and rejoin the Yankees. You know, I asked, um, Brian Cashman, uh, last weekend now, um, you know, if Cole is going to be out for a significant amount of time, you know, would they consider using him, uh, placing him on the 60 day injured list? And he said that it's a possibility. And the reason for that is because he's, he's, he said he's going to miss that time anyway. So if he's going to miss that time anyway, that means that he won't be able to return to, the Yankees until late May with, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's like the earliest. So we're probably looking at, you know, realistically early June for him to return. Um, it, it's a significant blow just because of the fact that when you look at the rotation, there's a lot of question marks. Um, but I would say that that's just baseball in general. Like what team out there, there's probably like one or two teams out there that don't have, um, many question marks in the rotation. The Yankees have, you know, I think at, at this point, five question marks um, mm. in their current rotation. But I do think that if they pitch to their expectations, I, I really do believe that they have enough to, you know, cover for Cole. It's not going to be the same, obviously. You know, last season when Cole wasn't pitching, he had a 5 the, the starting rotation had a 5.06 ERA for pitchers not named Garrett Cole. Um, that's not going to get it done, but I do think that they have enough um, to be better than what they were last season. Yeah, I okay, so I go back and forth on the rotation, just my, just my feelings on it overall as a collective. I think individually there's plenty of talent, and you had mentioned that every other team has questions in their rotation, and I think that – I definitely agree. I also think that there's like a variance in terms of actual talent levels and like floors and ceilings when you look at each team's rotation. And I think if we just go by talent, the Yankees would be in the upper half of the league. Um, just because I, I do think Carlos Rodon talent wise is is above average to elite. Strowman is definitely above average. Um, Nestor, if he's healthy. Actually, I'm not sure about Nestor, uh, and I think that's somebody we should probably talk about a little bit soon. Um, Clark Schmidt, I think, is an above-average talent-wise player or pitcher. And Heal, 
talent wise might be the most talented out of that entire group. Um, so, but I, I, this is all about performance and results, obviously. And I, it always comes back to Rodon for me. And I, I know a lot of people have said that, but I, I just can't put my finger on how I feel about him. I think that he's had a better spring than he gets credit for. I know that there's a lot of talk about his velocity and a lot of attention has been paid to that. But if you compare it to where he was last year, I think he's leaps and bounds ahead of where he was last year, just for the simple fact that he's healthy. And I always, and I'm curious about your, your thoughts on this, especially because you're around the team every day. I look at spring training for a lot of guys that are on the 26 man roster. Like they don't have to compete right out of the gate. They're not fighting for a spot. They're part of the core. They're part of the roster. I always look at spring training as like a season of craftsmanship, if that makes sense. So they're spending that time, refining their craft, maybe seeing if a new pitch could work, a new grip could work. You know, they have so much data now, obviously, that there might be tweaks that they could be working on that we don't have access to just because we're not that close and um, we're not around them to that degree. So I feel like for Rodon, he kind of fits in that category, at least for this spring training, or at least that's my hope. I mean, some of this might just be me like grasping at straws, but it feels like for certain players, they're working on stuff and the results obviously don't have a consequence and there's really there's a safety net. And it feels like for Rodon, part of it was obviously building up his velocity, but it felt like in a lot of his starts, he was like really conscious of working the, the cutter in mm -hmm. and like really attacking righties on the inside part of the corner and just really trying to refine that like elite command or that very nuanced command and you know you have he had really good starts his last start wasn't the best so i'm hoping that this is kind of like an effort on his part to just i'm just working on my craft and i'm spending this time to get better so when the lights come on i'm prepared to do the things that i need to do to elevate but i don't know if i'm grasping at straws or like this is rooted in hope but i generally think that spring training for guys that know they're going to make the team use that time as much as they can to get better. Like same thing with like Volpe's swing and his mm -hmm. new bat path. Like to me, the emphasis was and is on having better control of the zone, but also making sure that like he can put these new tweaks with his swing in game action. Same thing with Stan in his stance. So that's my hope with Rodon and a couple other guys in the rotation. Uh, you're you're definitely right, um, especially for pitchers. The most important staff for a pitcher is can they make the next start? For, and Rodon accomplished that. So right off the bat, that is a success. You know, people want to get caught up in the numbers, whatever. The numbers don't mean anything in spring training. Uh, you know, Volpe. You know, not to pick on Volpe, but Volpe was incredible in spring training. You thought that he was going to be the best shortstop in in the sport if you just watched what he did in March last year, and that obviously didn't translate to the regular season. And the, I think a lot of the times fans just get so caught up in uh, this guy had a seven ERA or this guy didn't give up one run. You know, some of that definitely matters, um, but for for guys who've been in the league for as long as Carlos has. It really doesn't matter. And and like you mentioned, he is working on specific things. Sometimes, you know, the the pitcher or, you know, talking with Matt Blake, that a lot of the times they're just not going to tell us, like talking as reporters, of like what the specific game plan was that day. Um, you mentioned, you know, Carlos is working on a cutter. You know, I asked Carlos um, during my one of my last days down there in Tampa, is like, you know, you've been working on the cutter. Like, is that really a, a real pitch? Cause sometimes not sometimes every single spring you hear across the league. Oh, this guy's working on a cutter. This guy's working on a splitter. This guy has a new grip for his curveball. And a lot of it is just like, they're not even going to use that in, in the regular season. Um, but for Carlos, you know, he, he did say that, you know, he, he does think it's a real pitch for him, but he also considers himself still a, a two pitch pitcher, which is his fastball and slider. And that's, that's going to continue to be the case. I, I do think it's important for him to, you know, have a, a third pitch that he can rely on, especially if one of those pitches 
just isn't as crisp that day. I think what we've seen so far with his cutter is that, um, you know, it has good movement. It has good velocity. He trusts it, which is important. Um, but I think for, for Carlos, it, it really comes down to command. His lack of command last year really killed him. Um, you know, outside of the injuries, obviously, when he was pitching on the mound, the lack of command was really what did him in. You know, he feels good about where his mechanics are right now. Um, I definitely think there's still a lot of skepticism surrounding Carlos and, and what his abilities actually are. Is he the pitcher that he was in 2021 and 2022 when he was a, you know, a National League Cy Young Award finalist? I don't know. I, I definitely have some doubts about just where he is. I do think that he has the possibility of being um, a pitcher who can be, you know, a frontline starter, you know, mid threes ERA. I think the Yankees would obviously take that just from where it was last year, but there's definitely a lot of pressure on Carlos to perform now that, now that Garrett's out, like it's, it's really on him. It's this, this rotation can be as good as it wants if Carlos performs to the level of expectations that he has for himself and the organization has for himself. If he's not good, you know, these first few months of the season could definitely go sideways um, for the rotation as a whole. And on that, let's take a quick break. Okay, we're back. So, Chris, you had mentioned that there are a lot of skeptics out there for Carlos Rodon. Being around the team, is that skepticism – permeating amongst the team and the coaching staff, or is this like outside noise? Because I know how people feel about him on the outside. I know that chorus, um, but in Tampa, inside the facility with people that see him every day, see the work that he's putting on, putting in, knowing what the game plans are, knowing what he's trying to work on. What's your sense of how the team feels about, Rodon's season and how much he can contribute this year compared to last year. Yeah. I mean, speaking with him, speaking with Matt Blake, Aaron Boone, they, they believe that, you know, this is the year for Carlos to show Yankee fans who he is. Um, and like I mentioned before, he's healthy and that is the biggest difference for him this year. That wasn't the case last year. He was never close to being a hundred percent at any point last year, even when he was healthy. Um, and he is that right now. So I think there are high expectations um, for Carlos to to deliver results that the Yankees frankly need out of him. There's no, there's no concern inside the clubhouse about Carlos and his abilities. He hasn't forgotten how to pitch. Yeah, he was terrible last year, but I, I I do think a lot of that is based on just him not being fully healthy. I, it sounds like an excuse, but that's just really the real the reality of his situation. He wasn't healthy, and he performed poorly because of those injuries. He is healthy this year. Now, if if, if he's bad again this year, then I I feel like the noise is 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 going to be even louder than what it was, and you know the concerns are are certainly warranted. But as of now. I feel cautiously optimistic about him um, bouncing back. Do I think he's going to have a sub three ERA like he had in 21 and, tw and 22 with the Giants? Probably not. Um, but again, like I said, if he gets a three, five, somewhere around there ERA, his strikeout totals bounce back to what they were in 21 and 22. I would consider that a successful season for Carlos. Um, you know, he doesn't need to be a, a Cy Young candidate, it would be nice, obviously. Um, you know, that would go a huge way for the Yankees' hopes, not only for the regular season, but for the playoffs. But if he can show that he can be a a, a true number two or, or even a number three, let's say, you know, Nestor or, or Stroman surpass him, that's totally fine, too. I just think that he has to be better than what he showed last year. Because um, we're, we're in year two of a $162 million deal. If this doesn't go well, I don't know where the Yankees go from here just because he's, he's obviously not going to have value across the league for, for any team to trade for him. Um, the Yankees are probably going to have to be forced to continue starting him if things go sideways. So 
they, there's nothing but hope that this can go well for Carlos this year. Yeah, that word hope. I don't know if that uh, <laughs> if that makes people feel better or worse about what it could be. But I mean, I think at this point, um, he doesn't really have the benefit of the doubt in New York. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to. And I, I'm pretty sure he knows that. Everybody knows that. Um, and I know that he he's going to have to, like, change a lot of people's opinions. Like I said, I, I go back and forth on him. I, I think, obviously, the talent's there. The pedigree is there. Um, and a lot of it might just be a health related thing, like you mentioned. I mean, there's no way that we can tell day to day the impact of uh, a, a player's health on their performance just because we, we we don't know. You know, we don't know if they're still dealing with it. They're playing catch up, what what have you. So um, Rodon is obviously the biggest key to this rotation, especially with Cole out. But I want to talk about Nestor, too, um, because we we talked a little bit about and I mentioned, you know, spending spring training to work on your craft. And I think that that holds true for Nestor as well. But obviously the results haven't been there. And I also feel like the it, part of the issue that he had last year, and obviously it was injury, injury related with his shoulder, but it feels like he goes through the lineup once or twice. And then he just kind of like falls off a cliff. And that was happening last year. And it feels like it's happening a little bit in spring training this year. And when I look at Nestor, when I look at Rodon, it's clear what he's working on. When I look at Nestor, I'm not totally sure what he's working on. I don't know if it's just like fastball command. It doesn't seem as like obvious to me. And it feels like he's had a little bit more of a struggle overall. Now, again, results don't matter, but it feels like maybe – for Nestor is as simple as let me just get through spring training healthy and get my body ready to perform for the regular season. But it just, it just feels like the process for Nestor is different than like a Rodon or a Stroman when I watched him pitch this spring. And he's another, as you said, there's probably five question marks right now in the rotation, but he's besides Rodon, he's the second biggest question mark for me. And I'm not – I feel just as unsure about what could happen with Nestor as I am with Rodon. I think there are different reasons for it. Um, but what have you thought of Nestor's spring so far? Or at, we're at the end of it. So what did you think of his spring overall? So I'm I, I'm actually encouraged with what I saw from Nestor. Oh, okay. And I'm, I'm, I may sound you know crazy because, again, when you see the stats, it's a 7-7-1 spring training ERA. I uh, think he gave up like 23 hits in 15 innings. You know, the stats are, are bad. Don't get me wrong. But what I am encouraged about with Nestor is when you go back to 2022, when he was an all-star, sub-3 ERA, really great season for Nestor. Um, when you look at the, the underlying metrics with Nestor in spring training this year, they're very similar to what they were in 2022. And I think that's what's most important. Um, for him. Um, that's why I'm really not concerned with where he's at right now. Do I think he's, you know, do I think he's going to be a sub three ERA pitcher again? No. But again, if he is even high threes, that, that goes a long way for the Yankees rotation as a whole. The The velocity is where it, it needs to be for Nestor. The movement, you know, a lot of his pitches are, are the success of those pitches are predicated on his movement, especially on his fastball. Um, you know, when his fastball is right, even though it's not the fastest fastball, but the movement is what makes it a special pitch. And the, the profile of, of his fastball is where it was in 2022. So I do think that if he can, you know, have a larger sample size, I think he's going to look fine. So that's why I'm, I'm not as of now, you know, ask me, you know, on April 25th after a couple starts, what we've seen. But, you know, right now, I'm not really concerned about Nestor. Um, I, I think he's going to be fine as long as he's healthy. You know, you did mention the fact that he was struggling a bit, you know, getting through three times through the order. That's definitely showed up a little bit in spring. Um, that, that's that's certainly something to keep an eye on. Um because last year that was a huge problem for him. And I do think a lot of that was 
injury related because he wasn't bouncing back in between his outings well until you know it got to a point where there was obviously something wrong and then they they shut him down with the shoulder injury but if that's still a problem this year that's a problem just because of the fact that you don't have Garrett Cole who you know is a guaranteed seven plus innings pretty much every start and when you look at the rotation right now you don't really have that guy who's going deep in the game. So if Nestor's going to be struggling, you know, when the third time of the order comes through, we're probably talking around the fifth inning, and then you start taxing your your bullpen, which was a problem last year. Yeah, the Yankees had a good ERA to finish the season, but you know, looking at it as a whole, the bullpen was just just fine, um, and a lot of that had to do with how much they were being used because the starting rotation outside of Cole was so bad. So you don't want to get into a situation this year where, you know, Nestor can't go through three times through the order. Um, You have Luis Heal, who's the fifth starter. You know, he's obviously going to have a short leash just because he's coming off of Tommy John hasn't pitched five plus innings since 2022. He's not pitching much. Um, Clark Schmidt's coming off of career high and workload and Marcus Stroman is, you know, had a couple of injuries last year. So, you know, you have to have someone go deep in a game. So if I was picking someone to, you know, bounce back to form, I I do think it's Nestor um, just because of what I was saying with his profile being the same or relatively the same to what it was in 2022. I think that they can, they being the Yankees navigate bullpen workload early on, just because it's obviously so many off days and, um, they can kind of manipulate the schedule a little bit. So when I think of it in terms of Cole coming back and Cole hopefully being able to be that workhorse, I think at at least at the beginning of the season, there might be a way for them to to manage things, even unless there's like disaster starts from multiple guys like back to back and you end up having these bullpen games because we probably won't see heel until maybe like a week or two into the season anyway, right? Just the way that the the rotation is going to – he would be scheduled to pitch the first game in Arizona. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess a little bit sooner than later or what I anticipated, but um, there might be a way to, to kind of manage it, but I, but I agree with you. I mean, if he, if he has the same problem that he had last year, just in terms of effectiveness multiple times through the order, it, it is going to be a problem um, because you already, especially with heel being the the fifth starter, like that's already, guaranteed to be a large bullpen game, I would assume. Um, Depending on how Rodon fares, you're going to have to use the bullpen then. Um, You mentioned somebody who I actually feel pretty confident in might take another leap, and that's Clark Schmidt. Um, I think last year he was really good, um, considering where he started and and how much he improved over over the season. I think obviously with him, it just comes back to how he gets lefties out and um, being able to really attack them. And that was kind of his bugaboo last year. Even when he was doing well, there were still moments when lefty batters or lefty heavy lineups would get to him. So how's the team feeling about uh, Clark? What did, what were your impressions of Clark? Like, how does he feel about his spring training? Um, it feels like to me that he's just going about his work and nobody's talking about him, which is probably a good thing. Like he's been a little bit under the radar, but I think he's been getting good work in. Um, I think there's been improvement from last year to now, or at least in the spring. I think I've seen improvement and he just seems to be going about his business and nobody's really paying attention to him, which maybe in this instance is a good thing. Cause maybe it represents some stability and consistency, but I think Clark can, take a step forward and be an even more effective starter this season. So uh, what are your impressions of Clark and what, what is the team feeling about him? Yeah. I mean, if you want to pick someone who I think can have a breakout year, I think it's Clark. I think his stuff is nasty. I think he has some of the the nastiest stuff across baseball. Um, It's just a matter of like command again. It's the same thing for Carlos. Um, If Clark can, hone in on his command. I I think he can be a really special pitcher. You know, I think for the Yankees to have him as their number four starter right now. And then when Cole comes back, 
um, the number five. That's really, really good. That's, you know, I, th- I think he has the potential of, you know, being someone who kind of emerges in the rotation this year. The one concern, obviously, is, you know, he's coming off a career high in innings. Never had this kind of workload before. He's had arm injuries in the past. That's one thing you have to, you know, be concerned about with him coming into 2024 is, coming off a, a career high in, in, in workload, just how is he going to look coming off that? You know, there was concerns about Nestor last year, you know, cause when you go back to 2022, when he was really special, never pitched that much before last year had, had injuries. I'm not saying the two are related, but you know, sometimes when someone pitches, Chris, you're already, you're already <laughs> wishing, uh, you know, we can't we can't jinx it. We can't jinx it. We can't go through another season of everybody's arm falling off and a leg falling <laughs> off and the Yankees not telling us until six months later. We can't do it again. <laughs> I mean, but you, you definitely do have to be concerned about that just from for every pitcher. Um, but if Clark can if Clark is the Clark that we saw in the second half of last year, I think the Yankees have something with him. Um I, I do think that you know, if, if you're a fantasy baseball player out there, if you're listening, um, I, I, I think he's someone I would I would pick, especially if he's dropping it in your drafts, just because of the fact that um, he is the most confident pitcher that the Yankees have. Not pitcher, player. Um, Clark is the most confident player in that clubhouse. He thinks that he is uh, better than Garrett Cole. He thinks he is not even in the same class as Garrett Cole. And and that's a good thing. You want your pitchers to feel like they're the guy on the mound. And he, he, every time he's out there, he feels like he is the best player on the field. And it doesn't matter if Shohei Otani's in the box or Mike Trout, it doesn't matter. Um, he believes that he has the stuff to get them out. Um, and I do think that coming into this season, I, I think there is um, hope. I, I, I use that word again, um, but I think there's hope that he can definitely take the next step forward. So we talked a lot, obviously, about the rotation, and part of the reason why it's such an emphasis uh, in this conversation is obviously because of a significant injury to Garrett Cole. And that brings me to bring up something that, raises the ire of I'm sure every Yankees fan and I would think also the people that cover the team and this comes to the way that the Yankees communicate injuries to the world and when we first started views the very first blog post I wrote actually was about how the Yankees handled one of the many Giancarlo Stan injuries uh, in 2019 and 2018 and how It became life's greatest mystery to find out what was wrong and when he was coming back. And it seems like that hasn't ended even today. And we're it's five years later in 2024. And for me, the way that the Yankees communicate injuries is I understand the logic of it, but it borders on kind of bizarre to me also. So I kind of have like this, this like duality when it comes to it. And interacting with people on Twitter. There's obviously two sides of everything and everybody's like kind of grounded in, in their belief in it. And some will say that Boone and the Yankees are protecting the players, which doesn't make total sense to me because eventually we're going to find out if somebody's not playing or in uniform, we know that something is wrong. Um, But for me, the issue comes down to trust And I think that especially with this Yankees team and how the fan base generally has grown frustrated, to say the least, that's probably the nicest word I could use, Um, and how pissed off many are over the last couple of years just because of lack of success in people's minds and inconsistency and then having a terrible year by their standards last year and losing to Houston again, there's just like this very, very intense frustration and for some anger towards the team. And I know for a fact that the Yankees are very aware of how they're perceived by the fan base. I mean, I've talked to people in the organization and it's very clear that they're aware of certain things and they're aware of 
perceptions and and receptions and reactions to things. So it confuses me that when it comes to injuries, they play this game and the game has gotten worse in a lot of ways. And I use the word trust because of where certain fans are with the team right now. And it could reflect in other ways that not necessarily harm the team, but like isn't a, a benefit for the team. And it doesn't make sense to me, like just to be like perfectly honest about it. I don't I don't really know what the benefits are of like of handling injuries and Boone essentially misleading people multiple times. Um, so as someone that covers a team, you're there, they're speaking to you directly. You have information, you have access, you have a better idea of what's going on than than most. How do you as a beat reporter feel about the way that the Yankees talk about injuries, especially when you know Tim doesn't like it either. Tim is my dog. He's he's pissed off about it too. Um, how do you feel about the Yankees essentially giving you misleading information multiple times when it comes to injuries? It's a very frustrating. Um, it's something that we – we being like the the beat reporters who are there asking injury questions, we talk about it all the time. It's very frustrating. And the fact is like, because of the, the misleading information that sometimes is given to us, we're having to ask the players and bother the players. Like we don't want to ask Aaron judge about his ab, uh, you know, his mysterious ab injury every single day. Because then it, then Judge is getting frustrated with us, and it just puts us in a bad spot. Like, we don't want to have to ask those questions. It's the, it's the worst questions to have to ask. It's the most annoying questions to have to ask. And it, it would definitely be much easier for everybody, not just, you know, the, the reporters, but for the team, for the players, if they were just straight up, um, more straight up than what they are. The Garrett Cole injury stuff, I do think that at the time they didn't have the information and that's why, you know, there was kind of like a, oh, something's going to happen tomorrow or we'll get results, you know, Friday or whatever it is. I just think they didn't have the results. The frustrating part is the, the, how they handled the judge stuff um, with the ab muscle. So he was out for, I think it was eight, nine days. I get it spring training and, and again, the games don't matter. But when you're having, when you're posting, you know, that he's going to be taking batting practice outside, it doesn't happen. You're posting that he's taking batting practice again outside, it doesn't happen. And that continued for four straight days. And then, you know, when, when we're there, obviously we're going to be like, well, something's going on. They must be hiding something. You know, does it, does judge have his ab muscles still, or are they, are they out of his body? Because like when you don't see the guy, you're gonna have questions that are are arising. And if if the plan changes, like as a reporter, if a if a plan changes, say Judge is scheduled to hit, you know, today at two o'clock, he never shows up at two o'clock. That that's something that you know, as a reporter, we're gonna ask about is is everything okay with Judge, especially with how they handle in injury information. So it's it's certainly frustrating. Um, you mentioned that they do it to protect the players. And that is the reason why they, they do it because um, especially with someone like judge, he does not like having a timeline given out for any sort of injury stuff um, because it puts pressure on him to return. And if he doesn't return at, a, at that date, then people are going to start freaking out. So that's why they, they kind of withhold information. It's just the stuff that like, you know, I'll, I'll use an example from last year. Uh, we were in Colorado, um, you know, in the dugout prior to a game. Um, and someone asked uh, Boone, you know, when is Jose Trevino coming back in the lineup? And, and at this point he had missed a couple games and he's like, yeah, you know, Trevi's beat up, you know, he'll, he'll be in the, he'll be in the lineup in like two days. And then like two days later he has wrist surgery. So it's like, you know, you know, you know, he's hurt, you know, he's hurt. So I just don't understand the point of something like that. So let me, I don't let think... me, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just, I have to ask you this question. When, when you guys reported and tweeted out in his quotes, I'm talking about Boone now. Mm -hmm. When we see these quotes, 
99.9% of the reaction is this guy's BSing us. Like mm-hmm. this is straight BS. Like the mid, the spring training, mid spring training beat up quote, I think we'll like live in infamy moving <laughs> forward. So our reaction is this BS. Like, here we go again with Boone. You're there. So when you hear him say mid spring training beat up, but there's an MRI, there's this, there's that. Are you thinking to yourself, this guy's BSing us and now I have to like navigate through this? Or are you like trying to be as professional as possible and like give him the benefit of the doubt? Yeah, I mean, like you have to give him the benefit of the doubt because, you know, it's not human nature to think that the person in front of me is lying. Um, And I I don't think the Yankees are intentionally lying about these injuries. I agree. Um, I agree. You know, a a lot of the times they are saying like an MRI is precautionary. There's no such thing as a precautionary MRI. You're not sticking a player in a tube because you think he's 100% fine. You think there's something wrong and you're trying to, you know, cancel something out if 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 nothing is there there's no such thing as a precautionary mri though like there's something that led to the mri you know for instance like luis severino was horrible last year they're not sticking him in a tube because he's horrible they're not sticking john carlos stanton (laughs) in in a tube because he's horrible like you're you're just not doing that so like something is leading to a player getting an mri so there's whenever a coach or a GM says, yeah, it's precautionary, that is BS because that, there's no such thing as that. Um, but I do think like the the day-to-day stuff with the injuries, you know, I, I do think that they're very cautious with what they say. Um, but again, like what you were saying before, it's like the injury is going to come out eventually. Um, you know, last year with with Judge's toe and, and you know, how they were navigating that, like, it's going to come out. Someone is going to report it. He's going to say something or a player is going to say something or whoever is going to say something eventually. So it's going to come out, Um, especially in spring training. Like the, the stakes aren't even high. Like the games don't matter if they lose, who cares if they win, who cares? So it's just like, why not just be straight up and say, the judge is going to, you know, work inside today. There's nothing wrong. And they were saying that, but again, when you, when you have a plan change, that that's when the questions start coming up. And that's why, you know, I had tweeted judge was scheduled to, you know, take batting practice outside. Didn't happen. Judge was scheduled to take batting <laughs> practice outside. Didn't happen. It's not a big deal. Cause you know, maybe he hit inside, but we, we don't have access to that. So I, I don't know. That's why, when, when that happens, you just have to attribute it to whoever said that because it, it may be true. It may be false. There's no way of knowing. Um, but I, I do wish that there was more clarity sometimes on injuries. And also, you know, sometimes like, you know, say Clay Holmes, I'll, I'll just use him. He hasn't pitched in five days or whatever it is. You know, they're not going to tell us that, hey, Clay is dealing with an elbow injury. Like we have to ask what's wrong with Clay Holmes? You know, my first year on the beat in 2022, yeah, 2022, Aroldis Chapman hadn't pitched in a couple day games. And you find, you find out that he has an infected tattoo. It's like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> yeah. And, that was and, crazy. And, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous stuff, but like, they're not, they're not going to tell us that like straight up. Right. It would be much easier if Boone, you know, s- sat down at the podium, you know, uh, or all this Chapman, he's going to be out for, you know, a week. He- he's dealing with an infected tattoo. Right. His you arm know. is burning off. Yeah. It's like, you know, Aaron Judge is dealing with, you know, an abdominal uh, injury. He's going to, you know, sit out a couple games. Like it would be much easier if they did that. Um, but they don't. And I don't think that's ever going to change. Well, one thing that isn't going to change is the need for us to go to a break. So we'll, Go to a break right now, and then we'll be back with more on the Views from 314 Feet podcast. And welcome back to the Views from 314 Feet podcast. It's Randy. It's Chris. Um, So we talked a lot about pitching, but obviously there's another side to the ball. That would be the offense, and the offense will be much different this year and hopefully much better than it was last year. I don't know if you could get much worse than last year. That That was bizarre for a lot of reasons, but obviously the biggest addition, Juan Soto, top five hitter, 
top five flair player in the league. I think he's going to bring a lot to the team. I mean, that's stating the obvious. But what do you think? Well, let me ask you this. How has he changed just the environment of the team, of the clubhouse, the facility? And how has he influenced the lineup already, even though it's spring training? Yeah, I mean, just from being inside the clubhouse, um, he seems to be making a good impression on his teammates. You know, every time I see him, he's like with a different guy. Um, you know, some days he's with Anthony Rizzo in the corner where Aaron Judge's locker is. You know, some days he's with like Everson Pereira, Oswaldo Cabrera, Oswald Peraza. You know, I, I've seen him like at Jose Trevino's locker. It seems like he's like trying his best to um, get everybody on board with just his presence. Um, he, he's definitely um, so far, I, I feel like he's been a, a really good presence in the clubhouse. Um, you know, there were definitely issues last year from with the Padres. Um, that clubhouse was not a good clubhouse to be in, in San Diego, just from what I've heard. Um, Juan Soto and Manny Machado did not see eye to eye. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see how he's going to fit in with the, the clubhouse here in New York so far, I think it's been good. Um, and I think just the fact that, you know, judge is the, the leader inside that clubhouse. He, he, he kind of has everybody in line. So I'm, I wouldn't be too concerned with that. Um, and, and even like guys like Stroman and, and Verdugo who've had problems in other clubhouses before, it seems like they, they are falling in line. Um, but for the lineup itself, it, it's a huge difference just because when you look look at last year, when Judge ran into Dodger Stadium's wall and ended up missing two months, the, the lineup cratered because there just wasn't anybody who could pick up the slack for Judge's absence. You know, say, you know, knock on wood, Judge has to miss time. You have Soto who can carry a team by himself just because of how special of a player he is. So I, I think the just his presence alone, if if he stays healthy and if Judge stays healthy, at minimum, this offense should be a top 10 offense in the sport. Um, and then you just you you go down the line, having those two guys, it takes pressure off Glaber Torres. It takes pressure off John Carlos Stanton. You know, you just you know move those guys down in the order, and now you're talking about a lineup that's pretty lengthy. Um, you know, there's obviously some concerns about third base, which we're we're about to get get into with DJ LeMahieu's um, foot injury. But if those guys can stay healthy, I think this offense has a chance to be a top three offense in the sport, which was not the case obviously last year. Um, and also, it's just going to be more exciting. Last year was painful to watch on a daily basis painful and i don't think that's going to be the case this year i also think and i think we can end the conversation with soto here i think that it's really important too that his addition kind of brings them back to the old yankees offensive philosophy in terms of wearing down pitchers mm -hmm. and i know that in modern day baseball things are a little bit different than previous uh eras of baseball just because middle relief probably isn't that underbelly as much as it was in the past i mean everybody's throwing like a ridiculous amount of gas and has some crazy breaking ball and blah 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 but i do think that that is a very tried and true offensive approach of power and patience and it feels like soto has reminded them of the patience part and it feels like his willingness to take a walk to have really competitive at bats is going to have an influence on the rest of the lineup. And it does feel like, especially if he bats second, you almost have when LeMayhew's back, it's almost like you have two leadoff hitters, but the second hitter is also like happens to be one of the greatest hitters of this generation. And I think that there is an incredible value to that. And over time, those at bats accumulate and help out guys like Verdugo and Torres and Volpe just because now you're getting a guy, a pitcher on the mound that's had to grind just to get through the first three or four or five guys. Then you have Rizzo who doesn't mind taking a walk. I think outside of the obvious, like very 
um, clear performance things, just the impact and influence of grinding at bats and working at bats and having competitive at bats is going to be very, very important for this team. And I think that that's amongst the other very important things that was missing last year. And even in some ways the year before this idea of just having really competitive, strong at bats from hitter to hitter consistently up and down the lineup has a lot of value. And I think that that was something that was a characteristic of these recent Yankees teams that has gone missing. And I think that it might not be something that we see on the box score all the time, but I think you'll notice it as they play and as these games unfold and games where the lineup is really clicking, that there's just a willingness to, to battle pitchers, but also pass the baton. I know it's a very like baseball cliche, um, but I think that that has a lot of value. And I think Soto's a great and probably the best reminder of how important that is. Um, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, I do think that he's going to be, I think he's going to make a, a very big difference on judge. Like obviously judge is the, uh, you know, the best slugger in the sport, but having Soto in front of him, you know, p- pitchers are going to have to pick their poison. Do they have to attack Soto and throw something across the plate to, to move on? Or are they going to be careful? And then if they're careful, then they have judge right behind him. Um, I, I think it's, it's going to be, I think there's the potential there for Judge and Soto, both of them, to each have close to their best individual seasons they've had in their careers just because of the fact that they have each other. Um, that's something that a lot of teams don't have. They don't have the that one-two punch that the Yankees have. Obviously, the Dodgers, the Braves have it. Um, but m- most teams don't have that, and I do think that um, – they're going they're going to add a lot to each other's games, I feel like. Strongly agree. So you mentioned third base. Big question mark now. Uh DJ LeMayhew. I know it's a different way of getting there, but another foot issue, another situation where it feels like it's coming along slowly and um that's gonna take a while. It's pretty obvious he's not gonna be in the opening day lineup, which might be fine. I think it becomes an issue if he's on the IL. Um, And he takes a while to get back feet for LeMay, who especially is a problem. Uh, I am a little alarmed. I know there's a bone bruise, but we see how much. I mean, I think it's true for any hitter, but especially for LeMay, how important his his feet are. I mean, that's obviously your base. And it really seems to impact him because he's so reliant upon hitting mechanics. I mean, he feels like a guy that like his mechanics really have to be in order for him to be as effective a hitter as he can, especially as an older player. Um, so I would tell me if I'm wrong. I'm I'm guessing here that Oswaldo Cabrera makes the team and is the starting uh, third baseman. How do you feel about that going into the season? Is it not that big of a deal? Could this become an issue? How do you feel about third base going into the season? It, going back to our injury conversation, here's another thing. You know, they Boone says that he has a pretty significant bone bruise, uh, I think like a week ago now. And, you know, there's the daily like, oh, he's he's getting closer. He's he's coming back. You know, when you say you have a pr- pretty significant bone bruise, is it a pretty significant bone bruise? If like, you know, you think he's going to be available by opening day? I don't know. Probably not. Um, but it seems like he's not going to be ready by opening day. So then, then it becomes, you know, does he have to go on the injured list? Is he going to be back within the 10 days? So you play a man short and just have him on the bench. Th- those are some questions that have yet to be answered yet. But for Oswaldo, you know, I think over the past like week and a half now, he's been hitting really well. That's always been the the concern with Oswaldo coming into spring is could he try and recapture what he was in 2022 when he was a spark plug, um, played right field, did a really good job in right field. Um, but last season, he was one of the bigger disappointments on the team. He just couldn't hit. He, he was really bad at the plate. From what we've seen over the past week and a half, you know, I think he's hitting over 400. He's obviously not going to be hitting up 400 in the regular season. But I, I think for him, it's really just – could he play uh, adequate defense at third base? I think the answer is yes. 
could he be someone at the bottom of the order who, you know, can do his job? I think the answer is yes. So I think there's, I don't think there's a much concern over Oswaldo, you know, getting playing time right now. I think he's fine. You know, long term, do you want to have him play 130 plus games? Probably not. But I do think that he is someone who is a fine bench option in the meantime, as as we wait for DJ. But I think there's, um, I, I do think there's a reason to be concerned with DJ just because it is the same foot that he had the injury in 22 when he didn't make the playoff roster, and obviously that lingered into last season. He was bad. Uh, for the first half of the season, he turned it around in the second half um, as the foot, you know, was finally fully healed. But now it's the same foot again, so it kind of feels like we're in a in a bit of a, a limbo waiting situation with DJ because of it. It's that same foot that he really struggled with for about a year. Their bench on the infield side feels weak. I mean, it's just yeah, it is is. It's just something that, you know, it's weird. Like, I obviously, this isn't a football podcast, but, like, I think of these rosters sometimes as, like, in the context of, like, depth, just because football, you need so many guys. Um, mm-hmm. and, it feel, and it feels like in certain roster construction, certain positions are just, like, punted. They're just, like, whatever. We're just going to deal with it. And it always feels now, or at least in, like, recent times, the Yankees just punt the bench. And they're just like, ah, we'll just get, like, a Marvin Gonzalez to – make it seem like, you know, he plays a bunch of positions, so it'll help. And it's like, well, Marvin Gonzalez is cooked, so this isn't going to work. And it just feels like I'm ha- I'm happy that they finally have outfield depth, but now it's, like, shifted to, like, lack of infield depth. And it's just like there are no real options. And obviously Peraza getting hurt is part of that. But um, as you had uh, written before early in spring training, it wasn't even a guarantee that he that Peraza was even going to make the team. So – it's just weird. Like every year now, there's like this lack of emphasis on improving the bench, and it always feels like it con- comes back to bite him in the ass later. Um, so hopefully the the DJ thing isn't doesn't last too long, and he'll be healthy and productive. But it just it, you always, it, it's always like one injury pops up, and you're always reminded of like how fragile the back end of this roster is like on the position player side and it it always confuses me i'm a big cashman fan like i don't hate on cashman i like brian um but it always feels like that's one area where they're just like ah we'll figure it out or it does not as important as it needs to be and it's always like kind of odd to me um yeah i mean i i think the depth killed them last year that was one of the biggest reasons why they stunk for most of the season is because they didn't have a bench you know, this year they're two of the guys who are probably going to make the roster unless they make a, a last minute deal or acquire someone off, off waivers is, you know, Kevin Smith and, and Jemai Jones. I think those guys are in the running to possibly make the team. Do you got, do you want who them? would have thought that? <laughs> like, do you, do you want them to have, you know, 20 at bats a week? Probably not, honestly. <laughs> no, uh, I don't. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't. No disrespect. I don't, yeah, no disrespect, but you know they're they're not quality players, especially for um, a team that has playoff aspirations. You know, I, as we saw last year, like every game matters. You know, you might you might think a, a midweek April game doesn't matter, but you know you never know. It like it could matter, and if you had a better better player in, in someone's spot, like it, it could have made the difference. You you, you don't know. Like it, it's hard to quantify that stuff, but. You know, for the Yankees, their their bench is is not that great right now. Um, it's it's I, I shouldn't say not that great. It's it's fine. You know, you have Trent Grisham, who is one of the best center fielders defensively. Um, not a not a great hitter, but you know he makes up for on 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 defense. And then the catching situation, either Jose Trevino or Austin Wells will be on the bench. Um, that's fine. But the the last two spots are are definitely shaky. I, I do think that they should try and upgrade um, in these next few days. They have options to to do that. Um, you know, Ben Rordvet is out of options. He's I, I don't see a way of for him making the team. You know, it's possible that he does make the opening day roster, and they do what they did last year with Esteban Florial. Florial made the roster. 
they had no intention of, of playing him, but they put him on waivers, I think, that following day after game one. Because at that point, a lot of these teams are settled. So he cleared waivers and was able to go and go to AAA. They made they, they could do something similar with Rortvet. They like Rortvet. So they could, you know, have him on the opening day roster, designate him for assignment the following day. Hopefully no one claims him and he goes to AAA. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a possibility. It's something that they can consider or they can try trading him. You know, teams do need catchers. It's not a it's not a deep position across the sport. So that's a possibility. You know, they have a couple of relievers who, you know, they could try and wheel and deal. You know, I look at someone like Ron Marinaccio who was was really good in 2022, pretty bad, not pretty bad, was bad last year and re- has struggled in spring. You know, maybe he's someone who could be re- rehomed and, you know, a team takes a flyer on him and, and tries to recapture what he did in 2022. So there, there are options that the Yankees could explore to, to upgrade the bench. I'm not, I wouldn't be like that concerned right now. It's March 25th as we record this. So there's time. You know, possibly by the time you hear this, they would have made a move to upgrade the bench because they they do have some some options to consider. All right. So we're towards the end of our first episode. Hope you guys have enjoyed it and uh, enjoyed the conversation. So we want to wrap up with some quick predictions. Chris and I will have one bold prediction for this season. And Chris, the floor is yours. My bold prediction, I think John Carlos Stan is going to play at least 130 games, and I think he's going to hit at least 35 home runs this year. I've, I've liked what I've seen with Stanton. Um, I think his body is in a better place. You know, last year, pitchers were throwing um, their off-speed pitches, change-ups, and their breaking balls against him lower than ever. I think his flexibility was shot last year. I think he's in a better place to, you know, reach those lower pitches in and out of the zone. I like what I've seen with his swing. I think he's in a really good place. I know I probably will sound crazy in two weeks when he's on the injured list again. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I do think that the potential is there for Stanton to bounce back. And I, I do think he, you know, I think he has the potential to be, a comeback player of the year candidate across major league baseball. You know, he's talented. I don't think he's forgotten how to hit. I think he's, I think it's, he's still got some juice left and that's my bold prediction. What it, it, do you have one that's bolder than that? Uh, it, I don't know. It might be on the same level. I just want to say I'm all in on Stan. So I'm totally with you. I mean, I I'm, I'll be crazy with you. If he's, if he's on the <laughs> IL <laughs> two weeks from now, we'll be in the crazy house together because uh, I'm buying into Stanton as well. So mine is uh, by the end of the season, Anthony Volpe will be a top five shortstop in the league. Like the Ooh, that, league. That's bold. Yeah. That is bold. I mean, I'm, I'm buying in on the uh, Volpe stock. Um, obviously a gold glove caliber defender already when people felt like he couldn't even play the position. So I think he's already shown uh, that he's capable of doing it. And to me, that's his baseline defensively. And I'm, I'm totally in on the swing path change. Uh, I had, I had noted it last year early on, just like how like wonky his bad path was. And it just like, didn't make sense to me. Um, and I, I just think that he can take a Glaber type leap and just in terms of like controlling the strike zone and knowing what pitches to swing at and um, not being as aggressive. I think he's an aggressive hitter generally. So I think that's part of his profile, but I think that he'll improve his pitch selection in the zone. And I just think that he'll be able to just make better contact. And I think with that, everything else will fall into place. He'll, he'll have more power. He'll be able to impact on the base pass more. I don't think he's ever going to be a super high on base guy because I think he's more of like a swinger than he is like a guy that are working at bat compared to other guys that we've talked about. But I think if he just if he can up his offensive production, I don't think there's going to be many shortstops that could be better than him. So um, that's my bold prediction. We'll see at the end of the year. You know, I'm sure all the Volpe haters on Twitter that, you know, engagement farm for an entire year uh dumping on a 21 year old who was one of the best players because everybody else was hurt 
will uh, come for me, but that's fine. I'll be used to it by then. So um, that's my bold prediction. I'm, I'm buying in on Volpe. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there, there's the potential there. I know a lot of people like to compare, you know, him with Bobby Witt Jr., who's obviously another young shortstop mm -hmm. with the Royals, uh, which struggled a little bit for the Royals in his freshman year freshman year like we're in college um, his, <laughs> yeah. his, his first year in 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 baseball um and, and he obviously had a really good season last year honestly i was surprised that volpe won the gold glove i thought bobby witt was gonna win no, i agree i agree the, like i i am stunned that witt wasn't even a finalist um yeah it's crazy uh, yeah i mean like volpe volpe was definitely good defensively but like to the naked eye like i i didn't think what I saw was like, oh wow, like this this is the gold glove shortstop. I think he was good. Um, but I, I, I do think that the potential is there for Volpe to be much better. I, I like like you, I do believe that his change in swing path is gonna be huge for him. You know, I wrote, I think last week or two weeks ago that when he there was a point last year when his bat path was actually flatter than the the norm, and that was August. August happened to be his best month of his rookie season, he posted almost a 900 OPS and that was with a flatter bat path, mm -hmm. flatter bat path. And then September, he got back to, you know, the uppercut swing and September was atrocious. For Terrible. Him. I think he, yeah, yeah, I think he, I think he was under 500 OPS. He was, he was really bad in, in September yeah, he was bad. and that was with an exaggerated bat path. So there, there are, reasons to be optimistic that if he can be consistent with his bat path that this season will go much better for him so I, I i like the pick i don't know about top five shortstop there are a lot of good shortstops in in baseball but i i, I respect the boldness i mean i gotta be bold it's go bold to go home that's how i look at it so yeah i mean i, Stanton, I predicted yeah i predicted Stanton yeah. to go one third so that's bold. <laughs> it is it is so we're doing it together so Stan's going to go off. Volpe's going to go off. We're going to go off because this is the end of the first episode for the views from 314 feet podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You can find us on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Please subscribe. We'll be dropping a new episode every Tuesday and we're very excited to get this going. And Chris, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you to the picture list podcast network for taking us on and we will speak to you all soon. And speak to you next week.